Good morning, everyone. We want to thank you guys for coming out. We do not mind the fact that it is only a few people here because we are excited about your presence. The reality is, is that if you are here, then our purpose would be or not. And so we are very grateful to have you here today to be able to pour into you, to inspire you, and encourage you into the next steps of your life. My name is Jamie Beal, and I'm the moderator for this phenomenal panel of authors and business owners. And so today we're going to be able to share a little bit about entrepreneurship, about the highs and the lows. Um, all of these authors um, and business owners are contributors of the author within. There are three volumes of this lovely book. There are three volumes of this lovely book, and they have all been featured at one or the other. And this book has been published by 220 Communications, which I am also an author of. And so today we're just going to have fun, have some real conversation. You guys ready to have fun? I am. Yes. You ready? Yeah. All right, we're going to have some conversations. <laughs> it's going to be some interactions, and there's definitely going to be some time for some questions. I do have some pre-prepared, but for those um, that I don't hit, we're going to definitely make sure that you guys get a chance to ask them, okay? So we're going to start off by allowing each of the business owners to introduce themselves in 30 seconds and let us know which volume of this phenomenal book that they were in. Uh, good morning. My name is Pierre Du Bois. I am the founder of Zamana. Uh, Zamana is a web analytics and digital marketing analytics services company, um, providing services for small and medium-sized businesses. And I am a co-author of volume number three. Hello, everyone. My name is Tanya Biglow. I am the founder of Trusted Wealth Builders, um, where we help individuals to see the wealth not just outside of them, but also inside of them. And I am a contributor of volume three, Process of Success. I am Daniel C. Lewis. I am the owner of Lewis Enterprises, several little businesses, including a notary service, uh, small studio, and also legal services. And I am a contributor in volume number three. <laughs> yes. I am Tiffany Green. I am a contributing author for TEW2. And I am the owner of Black Writing Space, which is a uh, blog talk radio show, slash uh, writers and authors blog, and uh, just a platform for writers and authors, and also uh, Andreana Parker Photographer. Good morning. My name is Glenn Murray. I am the owner of a company called 220 Communications. Um, which of course, as Jamie mentioned, we've published 32 amazing stories over the last five years. Also, uh, we do some other things, entertainment, um, and just marketing and consulting. I wrote a chapter in TW1, the first book, called Relationship Building Essential for Business and Essential for Life. Awesome. So we're gonna get started. I believe that there is a purpose for everything and a reason we have this event is to be able to empower and to get insight. So we had a why for being here today. So today we're going to start off and we're going to ask a couple of the business owners what was their why in becoming an entrepreneur. Tiffany, why don't you go ahead and answer that first. Why? Why I became an entrepreneur? I believe it was already, it was already in me. It was already on the inside of me. I already had to um, the gift of entrepreneur. I don't think I had a choice in the matter. Um, I was already different. I never fit in. So, um, I was just, um, I refused to accept the um, the nine to five traditional and just miserable. I didn't want to be miserable. So, that was my life. Oh, my why came from all the motivational speeches I got from people that told me I couldn't do anything. Or uh, in corporate America, uh, for example, if I had an idea, I would be told, oh, that's, the, that's not really a good idea. And then a couple months later, that person who told me that was using my idea and they were getting promoted. So I, that, those kind of motivational speeches um, <laughs> helped me say, well, maybe I'm, I should... Uh, I have something going here where the people use my ideas. I should, and also I have um, uh, three boys uh, that I wanted to be an example for. We'll take a time to give you your 
I became an entrepreneur because I got fired. <laughs> motivational speech. That's your motivational speech there. Encouragement. <laughs> yes, I, I was fired, and it wasn't because of any actual action that I did. It was just a conflict of personality. And, you know, I did what my parents told me to do. I went to school, I got good grades, I got a physics degree. Like, who does Ooh, that, right? right. <laughs> so I did what I, was, that, what I felt I was supposed to do in order to live the life that they sold us back in the 80s and 90s. And I realized that that was my parents' dream. It wasn't my dream. So, awesome. You know, growing up, when I first heard the word entrepreneur, I just thought, be your own boss. Mm -hmm. You know, Get up when you want to, go into an office if you want to or not. Here, I'm going to start with you. What is being an entrepreneur, and what was the moment that you knew you were? Good question. Um, an entrepreneur, for me, is somebody who's trying to change the world. Um, a lot of times you run into people that think, OK, I want to make a whole lot, whole lot of money. Um, not always true at the very beginning, I'll say that much. Um, there's always a struggle that goes into it. Um, but what gets you through that struggle is understanding that you are making an impact at some level. Uh, one of the nice things for analytics that I enjoy is that I work with different small business owners and you get to hear a little bit, you know, just like you're asking us, you know, what's the why? I get to hear a little bit of that and try to help them achieve that goal, basically. So that's one of the things I really love about it. Um, and then the second question, why did it make me an entrepreneur? When did you know? When did I know? I hear. <laughs> Wow, that's a good question. Um, I think for me, it was the day that I started Zamana. Um, and the reason why, there was a long story that went into it, but the original plan for Zamana was to be a uh, venture capital firm. And um, I was kind of far off course for that for a lot of different reasons, basically. But the day that I decided to start, uh, it had been a year anniversary since my dad had passed away. Um, I, too, was also let go from the job, so I got that motivation as well. Um, and I knew I wanted to do analytics, but I wasn't sure what the, what the market was. I went and researched and found where small businesses were uh, investing into their websites, which is important because as an entrepreneur, you want to change the world, but you have to kind of bring those pieces together. And so I felt that my mission was to help small businesses say, hey, look, if you're not investing in your digital presence, your competitors are. Okay. And that made it possible for me to have that, you know, to realize, okay, I think I can pull this together and we can, we can make this work. And it's been six years running, so. Awesome. Same question for you, Glenn. What is, what is an entrepreneur, and when did you know, I'm, that's me. <laughs> I don't know. I think I was just so hard headed until I just kept trying to do things and trying to do things until I became successful at a few of them, honestly. Um, part of being an entrepreneur, entrepreneur is being kind of hard headed. You kind of have to tune out all of the noise that tells you you can't do anything. Um, I remember this like it was yesterday, sitting at a Starbucks. I was in Lakeview and I was talking to a guy who was doing some business with that and doing events. I'm like, you know, I'm really, events aren't what I really want to do. I don't want to just kind of be the guy that throws parties. I want to get into other things. I rep writers, I talk to some authors, I want to start a publishing company. And his first word was, oh, you shouldn't do that. You know, everybody's going to go to ebooks and nobody's going to be picking up books, paperbacks and everything, and you're just going to lose money, you know. And had I stopped right there, I think about what wouldn't have happened. All the great people I wouldn't have met, the things that we wouldn't be doing, I wouldn't be here today, probably doing this. I'd probably still be trying to do parties and make $20 a night <laughs> off of those and wonder what the hell am I doing, stuff like that. So I think I knew it when I stopped listening to the world tell you what you couldn't do. That's when you really know. And you're like, okay, no matter what you say, I know what's inside of me, um, and I know what I can accomplish. That's awesome. Daniel, in your contribution to TEW, the name of your chapter is Starting and Running My a lot of people have a great plan. There's a lot of power in the start. So tell me about, give us a little bit more perspective on the importance of starting and how important it is to lay a solid foundation. Oh, that's critical. Uh, starting a business is, uh, doing it the right way is critical because if you don't start, there's always, there's never will be a step two if you've never, never taken step one. 
So you always have to start, and when you start your business, you have to start it with, like you said, laying a foundation. Uh, you don't want to start your business just, a lot of people go out there and just with a lot of action. A lot of action will get you started, but it won't hold your business up. Your business won't stand the test of time. Uh, so what I suggest when you start your business, the first thing you do is just like if you're building a house. You don't just go out and start putting up sticks and stuff. You, you sit down and you draw out everything. Even uh, this chair we're sitting in, before someone put it together, someone sat down and said, let me see how we're going to diagram this chair. And we all are able to sit, hopefully, very comfortably on this chair. But that's what you have to do as far as uh, entrepreneur. That's just critical. You have to sit down with a sheet, a sheet of paper, I suggest a sheet of paper, and write out because there's magic to you manually writing out, I think, what you want to do, point by point by point by point. There's just magic, um, and you that's just critical. If you're going to start a business and you have goals uh, that hitting your business, which you should have, you definitely want to write those out, how you're going to hit those goals, step by step by step by step by step. And just remember, there is, we have everybody, with a successful business and a non-successful business has uh, one thing in common. They have 86,400 seconds in each day. You've got to use each of those seconds correctly. Love it, I love it. Speaking of seconds and moving through them, Tanya, I want to ask you, the name of your chapter was was a process of success. Um, I have a saying that I tell myself on difficult days, progress through the process. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't, you have to go through the process. Tell us about um, a point in your process that was difficult, but what you found to help you keep going. So for me, in that process, it was like every day is difficult. <laughs> you know, you have to really get up every day and have the mindset, okay, I'm going to pursue, I'm going to keep going, I'm going to go forward, I'm going to just do something because it's so easy to quit on ourselves because there's nobody there holding us accountable. We don't have a manager, we don't have a boss, we don't have, you know, you know, it, it, it's almost as if when we were growing up, you know, we are held accountable based on our parents' standards, but we're never taught to be accountable on our own standards. So as adults, when it's time for us to get up and go and do for ourselves, we find ourselves saying, oh, I'll do it later. For us, you know, for 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 us. Um, but if we, it was a difference, if when I worked for corporate America, it was like, okay, it's like I have to be there by nine o'clock. You know, I have to stay until noon or five or you know whatever it is. It was some um, parameters set. So for me, I I find it a, a process every day to get up and make sure that I do for me and my household the same way I did to fulfill somebody else's dream. I love it, I love it. Tiffany, your chapter is called Just Do It. What is the it and how do you continue to stay focused on it? Mm. The it for me was, um, I was fired as well. But <laughs> I wanted to be fired. <laughs> I did. I really did. People look at me like I'm crazy when I say that. But um, I wanted to be fired. So when it um, finally happened, it was just like I felt like relief. So the it was okay. Now you're fired. Now you can go and live life. And um, so my thing was okay. This is the Instinct. That was my instinct to increase at that moment because mm -hmm. now I have um, the option to. This well, you know what? I was still doing the photography. Um, Black writer space was just sitting, and it's like, okay, now you have that um, option to work it. Just try to work it full time. It's like whatever work it means, <laughs> let's, let's do it. Yeah. So, um, what was the second part of the question? And what keeps you focused on it? That was the it. What keeps me focused on it is because, man, it's like when you come, 
We all have a gift. Everybody on this panel, it, everybody in this world has some sort of gift. Like it's already on the inside of us, everything that we need to succeed. So it's like, what keeps me focused on it is, I have, like, if I don't do it, it's not gonna happen. If, if I don't, like, I can just sit there and think about it all the time, because I'll be thinking, oh, I need to listen to that. Dang, oh, wow, oh, I gotta do this. I was supposed to do this, I was supposed to do that. But if I don't get up and do it, so it's like seeing it, seeing it, to answer your question, seeing it is the push for me. Seeing it in my mind and knowing that it can happen and knowing that it's original, nobody else came up with it. It was unique to only you. Like what? And then once people just like when I created Black Writer Space, people came out of just well. I was getting emails, phone calls. I had a phone call at twelve midnight. I'm trying to get some information about Black Writer Space. I'm like, this is what I'm supposed to really yeah. be doing. Yeah. So that that's my that's my um, that's my push is knowing that okay I have it I have the gift already I have everything that I need to make this thing work I have to do it if I don't do it it's not gonna happen so that's that's my thing and seeing the vision because the more I see it the more it's like you got to do this what you're gonna do live for the next 50 years and just want keep to talking do. about it and one thinking one. about it yeah. right so that, that was my thing. you brought up a word Tiffany um, that really pulled on me and it was original here, I want to direct this question to you. Um, when McDonald's and Burger King and Wendy's are all across the street from each other, they are concerned about one another, but not really, because they are very unique. McDonald's special sauce, Burger King, plain broiled, Wendy's red pigtails. Whatever the case may be, <laughs> there is an originality. What makes you different than another analytics company? And secondly, how do you not allow yourself to get caught up in the, what the competition is doing, but staying true to what you know, what you were doing to you? That's a good question. Um, for analytics, for me, it's, it's about servicing small and medium-sized businesses and kind of helping them, to, using the analytics to bridge together their marketing um, plans, services, maybe some of their assets, basically. Um, a lot of analytics firms don't do that. Um, smaller businesses tend to be a little bit more difficult to uh, manage from time to time because they usually have very unique, just as you mentioned a little before, they usually have very unique cir circumstances. And one of the things you have to weigh is, is it unique because they are lacking some resources but can still grow? Are they, or are they unique because, I had to learn this the hard way, I, um, are they unique because they really are lacking something that, that's, that you look at and say, well, there's, there's really a big question here. I used to think, starting out, that if you had a need for a website, that, oh, you're, you're a great customer. This is probably, you know, the, this is really gonna make some sense. And there were times when, sometimes a business that didn't have the best website, sometimes it was because they were not investing in anything within the business, which is a signal to tell you that maybe that, that they're not really thinking, right. they're not really ready or even thinking of it. And I've, I've probably had maybe one or two times where I've had to deal with fraud up front, which is pretty deep. So it taught me to think a little bit more about the questions to ask and, and really help those business owners understand that the analytics is not just looking at the data, it's also looking at how you structure it and how do you want to get a message out there. And I think that's what makes me unique is that I'm actually helping them in a way that a lot of people would never get. Help them establish their goals even because they may not know. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Tanya, you had mentioned something that made me think and I want to ask Lynn this question. You talked about when you work for a company you get up and you make time to do this and you punch out at this time and you go to lunch at this time. Lynn, you are not only responsible for a business but you're responsible for a lot of people within the business. So how do you manage delegation as well as time management even for yourself? You know, delegation is hard still. Uh, I would be lying if I told you I'm really good at delegating everything I need to delegate. It's not true, because I know it. it's stuff I hold on to. It's because it's that whole parent mentality. It's your baby, you started it, and you feel like if it's gonna be done right, you can do it. Um, I've slowly but surely gotten better over the years as we started to grow. I had to understand that there wasn't gonna be growth unless I knew how to let go of some things. Um, but managing people, it's difficult. We have people that work jobs, and, and then they work part-time on 220 as well. So it's really, Figuring out 
how you can get the most out of that person for whatever they can give you for that day. And I always tell people, I'm not asking you for eight hours a day, but I'm asking you, when you do work that one hour, I need the best hour you can give me at that time. Um, so a lot of it is putting people in the position to succeed. So it's a lot of communication and figuring out what people like. Um, and we do reshuffle ball all the time. I don't, don't expect that the way you come in is not the way you're going to go out. It, it might be the way you, you'll have a different job the next month. Because I like moving people around to see what they're good at. You know, I have people that love to do events. So, you know, I, I throw it at them. I'm like, okay, you're in charge of this event. Figure it out. If you like events, let's see what you can do with it. Or I have people that love publishing or want to edit or do things. And now we've even gotten into going into our pool of talent. And like some of our authors are now working on projects, on book projects. So they're literally helping other authors get their books out. And I think that's a good way to feed on the energy of, okay, you know what it's like to be a first-time author, so now you're helping somebody else. So you're taking them through the process that you've been through, and you understand the pitfalls and things like that. So it's really not necessarily managing their time, but putting them in the right positions so they're, in June, they're enthusiastic and enjoying what they're doing, and I think you'll get the best out of them. Awesome. This next question, I want everyone, um, I would like everyone for, to answer in at least 30 seconds. Um, some of you are parents. Some of you are helping to take care of your parents. You have other lives outside of your business. So if each of you could give us insight on balance. How do you balance? <laughs> so whoever, wants, whoever wants to start. <laughs> or you can even talk about your struggle with balance. I think that that's a very transparent um, answer as well. <laughs> so uh, whoever would like to start. Hi, come here. <laughs> <laughs> we saw your precious angels here today. <laughs> Balance is, it, it, does that word exist? I've heard it. Is. <laughs> it's in the dictionary. Um, it, 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 is, it is somewhat challenging, definitely, um, when you work for yourself, um, when you're a mom, and I'm homeschooling my kids. <laughs> So balance is just like we're going to get in where we fit in. <laughs> um, but on a serious tip, it's really all about scheduling. And you don't, but you don't want to live your life on a schedule. So you almost have to schedule time not to do stuff. <laughs> you know, but it, it really all just comes down to scheduling. And whenever you're going to do whatever it is that's on the schedule, be there be present in that and give that all that you can because when you go to the next thing that's off <laughs> and that's hard for you know it, it's kind of difficult for me but you know I just try to whenever I schedule something I'll be in I'm in that moment at that time awesome. Awesome. I was just trying to figure out what balance was <laughs> before I could answer the question no seriously I um yeah I've got a lot going on have a lot going on right now. Um, for me, like Tiny said, it's kind of almost scheduling yourself to be off and be away. But it's very difficult for me because at any given time, I mean, there's, you know, I'm, I'm taking care of my mom right now who's recovering. Um, but also, at any given time, we've got like 30 authors, I have a music artist, we are working on no less than five events over the next three or four months. And then I'm also talking to people about partnering with you trying to do bigger things. So like I've already got a calendar that stretches into next October of things that are in my head or either tentatively on paper and that I'm trying to do. So that's where delegation comes in now. So you know, just kind of assigning somebody to start thinking of those things for me to kind of help me too, because you can't be in a vacuum when you're trying to find some balance, and that's what I want. Um, it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to say, okay, I've hit the ball. Um, and it's okay to take a break from, from everything. Say that again out loud so you can get that on time. <laughs> no, <laughs> that never happens. Um, but yeah, it's okay to take a break from things sometimes. Um, you know, people will understand. You know, if people see that, you, you know, it's not like people don't see that you have a lot going on. So sometimes people will take a step back once they see, okay, he needs that time. And that's what I've found. And I've really found it like in the last year and a half. Before that, I had no sense of balance or no sense of time. And 
I figured everybody else should be just like me and work 23 and a half hours. Right. You know, and I still expect that sometimes, actually. I'm not going to lie. Some days I think everybody should, should be on that call. Yeah, you're yeah exactly. <laughs> What's wrong with a 3 a.m. message? Yeah. Right. I should answer me back. Yeah. 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 I, I want to add to that a little bit, too. I just, um, I think for me, initially, I made the assumption that there was not going to be any balance because it's not just because being a small business owner, it was also because analytics was relatively new, and I knew that part of the struggle for me was trying to structure. Uh, because I'm single. Uh, so some, some people think, well, okay, well, he's single. He's got more time than anybody else. Not, not really. I actually, and I, I'll be honest, in some ways, I, I actually was hesitant about dating or doing anything else because I just wasn't sure how to structure that time. And then it became, um, a lot of people asked me to write, um, which surprised me, so that also built onto it. Um, but I think some of the things I had to learn along the way is I knew, in fact, now I'm, this is a good question for me because now I'm at a point where I'm actually talking a little bit more. I knew that there was going to be a point where I would back off a little bit more and try to make time for people. Uh, the things I had to learn how to do was, uh, you know, like Lynn, also I wanted the 3 a.m. email, you know, and there was a, and, and, but the thing that was interesting was I had clients I had to work with where they also wanted not only the 3 a.m. email, but I have to be mindful that if I mess up at my end, I might be throwing off somebody else's balance as well, too. And, and you have to kind of, I think one of the things you learn is, um, you learn as you work with people that it's important that if you decide to be extreme, that's it, fine. But make sure that you understand that other people are not quite as extreme. And, you, and you'll figure out with each person what you can and can't do. Um, and the one thing about uh, taking breaks and everything else, I had a very weird time where I actually, I literally collapsed um, at a friend's house on a day when I actually took a break. Um, and it was just, yeah, it was, it was just weird. It was just very weird. We were having dinner and something didn't feel um, right. And then next thing I remember, I, I literally like blacked out and was looking up. There was a paramedic bringing me in on a gurney and bringing me to the hospital. Um, I literally had like collapsed and they said that I hit my heart at AFib for a couple of moments, basically. Um, nothing but, but it was, and, and I didn't like how it scared everybody around me. So it's like for a couple of days, I definitely was on a break more and longer. Um, the thing I, I tell you is, is that um, probably if I had to do something over again, I would think a little bit more critically about exercise. That was the one thing that I also had a struggle with. Um, I'm not, you know, I didn't have very big health problems, but it was just also, it was a wake up like, okay, you need, you need to kind of take breaks from time to time. Um, and, and I think you just learn a little bit as you go along. Um, there's, there's, there's never going to quite be a balance, but you just need to be aware as you move forward, like, hey, it's been X amount of time since you've done this. It's been X amount of time since you've done that. That's good. That just a little adjustment to maybe reading three or four minutes more a day on the issue that you're having challenges with with your business. It's about making those little things, doing something small each day to get you just a little bit better, just a little bit better, just a little bit better. I'm, I'm great with, with men and what is balance. <laughs> um, um, <clears throat> I think um, I, I agree with what everyone said up here. Um, scheduling and <laughs> <laughs> scheduling and um, just scheduling. <laughs> scheduling. And, and we probably still don't stick strictly to the schedule, but at least my, my problem is making a schedule, write the vision down, make it plain. I write it down, I make the schedule, and I don't do nothing. That's my problem. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I'm definitely um, having a problem with um, doing what I write down <laughs> and balance. So, but um, having two different businesses is a struggle for me with balance. And also, um, how do I deal with it? With that. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you're self revelation. <laughs> <laughs> I need a great team. I know to the audience, you're always learning something new about yourself. Yeah. <laughs> I need to see somebody about that. So, um, but yeah, balancing, definitely scheduling, um, doing, what, doing what I say I'm going to do. I'm not going to say what you say. What I say, I'm going to do, do it. What I'm thinking in my head, do it. When is it gonna happen? How are you gonna bring the vision for it if you just vision it? <laughs> you know, <laughs> talking to me right now. So balance definitely scheduling and 
doing what I say I'm going to do. Awesome. Well, I have a couple more questions. I want to take a break and see if there are any questions from the audience at this time. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I just have a question. How do you market yourself? Because being an entrepreneur, you have to get paid. See my mom? <laughs> so I think everybody can, because all of you all do something different in what you do. Uh, so how do you market yourself? Go down the line. All right. Um, Mine's been a little bit of a mixture of self-initiative and also a little bit of luck. I'm going to tell you the luck part. Um, the luck part that came in was I, I, I started writing about analytics. Because um, analytics, usually there's a process in terms of adding tags, um, talking to customers. And you want to be able to educate your customer to some degree. So that way, when, they're, when they do need tags and they really need to step up, they'll be ready. And what ended up happening was I got requests from um, I had an editor who um, was working with, for me for with uh, small business trends on uh, book reviews, and they happened to go over to a site that was I uh, was writing on analytics, and said, "Hey, we were looking for somebody to write on analytics," and it snowballed to the point where now I'm writing for four different sites on analytics. Um, so the reason why I bring that up is that it's it's content, um, it's form content marketing. You still I still write for my own blog, um, but I also write for others as well, and I write about my expertise. That's the most important piece. If you're not doing, if, if you're going to go into business, I don't care if you're selling paper clips. You need to be able to talk about paper clips, about the metal that's made, yeah. the casting that goes into okay. the paper clip. You know, the, the type of attachment. Oh, we don't need glue. Why paper clips are the number one thing in the world? You need to be able to speak to your expertise. Um, you can do it through content. Um, and if you prefer doing it from video, and you, you probably seen here for someone doing Periscope, Vine, uh, YouTube. There's you know, educating your customer is one big big part of it. Um, the other parts are, um, in terms of, uh, I would say, just a little bit of advertising. Um, a lot of times people think of SEL, but they don't think in terms of paid search. And paid search is broadened now into sorts of things in terms of social media ads, uh, whether it's Twitter, whether it's, um, uh, I think Instagram does ads now, basically. Um, being able to do a few ads about events like this, <laughs> for example, um, that can also help in terms of drawing people in um, for a specific purpose. Um, but those are those are things that helped me, and I try to push for clients. Um, a lot of times it's a little bit of balance, but those are things that help. I, I think it, it varies, but for me, because I work more one-on-one -on -one with individuals, I did a lot of networking. So I came from corporate America where I just, you know, I had my little desk job and I, you know, it was me and my world. And I didn't really have a lot of outside people. So I literally one year went from like zero people of contacts to 400 in a year. But I was out networking. And, you know, I've built that up to thousands of people now. But, um, you know, it, I think networking is definitely the key when you're, you know, when you have a small business and you're working more one-on-one -on -one with uh, clients. Networking is the biggest thing I can recommend someone. Anybody else want to answer? No, you don't have to feel forced. I'll be forced to answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, for me, uh, there's a number of things. There's no one thing that really helps uh, you with marketing, there's a number of things that help you with marketing, uh, networking, um, knowing your product, um, uh, social media. Uh, also, one of the biggest things that really helped me with my business is uh, getting a mentor and talking to a mentor. I had a mentor when I uh, first started my first business. I went to him and said, I looked up to this guy and said, hey, you know what, I'm going to start this business. And of course, he said, are you crazy? Mm -hmm. That was Eric Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> that is you're, you're, you're leaving a perfectly good job. And, but that really helped motivate me. And I said, well, you know what? Maybe I am a little crazy because I haven't sat down and had a conviction in my own dream to go out there and do that. So I developed a business plan and went to other people. And I and I always now go back to my mentor, Eric Anderson. <laughs> and uh, ask him different questions and pick his brain, but um, it's been good. Get the mentor, education, social media, 
talking about your business, if you're talking to someone about your business and they say, oh, I don't know if that's going to work, then you got to, instead of checking them, you got to check yourself. Am I passionate enough to make this work for my family to pay my mortgage, car payments, my children's education? I mean, hopefully that answers your question. It does. And you did a key right there, and you said about, is this going to make enough money for me to... Yes. Yes, and um, being a business owner is great because you can always give yourself a raise. Oh. <laughs> and that raise becomes effective as soon as you become more effective as a business owner. Right. That's good. That's good. That's good. I'm stealing. I know, right? I stole that one. <laughs> <laughs> I stole that one. Just keep stealing. <laughs> um, for me, marketing, I always tell people, internet, word of mouth, um, like she said, networking, um, knowing your field. Like, I know ask me a question about a camera and a wedding photography. And then with Black Rider Space, that definitely was internet. And I came on the scene like 2007. And it wasn't as like everything is now, but I started a, it originally started as a networking site for writers and authors. So you could join, be a member, it was free. And I built it up to about 500, then I lost it. So then it's like, okay, so let me, I got on Facebook and this and that, so it, but it continued to grow. So with that, it was like strictly internet and then the radio show came and this and that, but with the photography, it's more so one-on-one. -on -one. So it's more uh, networking, dealing with clients one-on-one. -on -one. So um, I never looked at myself as sales. I'm like, I'm not selling nothing for nobody, but as small business owners, we're selling ourselves. Okay. I work in sales now. Yeah. So, um, other than someone seeing, because um, I don't really make money off of Facebook, but it gives me great exposure. You know, someone sees your work, they may not use your services, but they'll tell someone who needs them. So it's, it's like somebody said, it's the number of things yeah. that helps. Yeah, I, for me, it would be a really long answer, so I'm going to give you the elevator pitch on okay. it, because it's a long answer, because my journey from marketing, because my background is marketing, so I started in corporate America in direct marketing. So old school sending you some mail, <laughs> calling you on the phone, all those things that seem archaic now is how I started. So I learned, and, and if you look at it now, social media is really direct marketing. Because mm -hmm. instead of a letter, I'm tweeting, I'm posting, I'm doing the same things. But there's three, if I were to look at marketing, there's three things that I would look at. I would look at um, branding, uh, which is really building your brand and making people aware of your brand. There's positioning which is just as important as anything else, I'll talk a little bit about that one. And then there's true marketing, right, which is paid or free. So given the length of my time in business, my evolution from what I've done has been very different. When I started, it was all about branding and getting my name out there. So I had started out, first business I had was an art business really quickly. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna find people that like the arts and give them free gift certificates to come and buy art, like ten dollars off or something. So I found the poetry group because they had art, they did it at an art gallery. So I was like, I want to come in and give you guys all your people that come to your art show, your poetry shows, free gift certificates to go to my art website. So it was branding and letting people know I had an art business, number one, and positioning to say, okay, I'm positioning myself in an atmosphere where people have an affinity for my product. So that was the first thing I did. Um, after I got rid of the art business, because work with artists is like <laughs> like 16 year old teenagers that have problems. <laughs> so never again will I ever, I swear. That's a whole other story, too. Anyway, um, positioning. Positioning is very important. And the things we do now are more about positioning. Um, a couple of things I did. Because I worked in marketing in corporate America, I was able to do deals. I did a deal with a travel company where I bought in bulk trips to Las Vegas. So now we give away trips to Las Vegas to charity events. Um, we're doing like a big Chicago Fashion Week event where we're giving away a trip to Las Vegas. So what does that do? That positions people. That tells people that 220 Communications is out here doing bigger things. People want to know what we're doing. So then we pull them in and we talk about publishing. We talk about events and things like that. We do an event called Wine Crawl. Um, and I was doing that for about a year. And then I got involved in a, in a wine company called Love Corks Group. So I became a part owner of a wine brand. Because I do wine crawls, I'm now positioned with a wine brand so I can sell my brand at the wine crawl. So position, it's all about figuring out what you're doing, figuring out how you can triangulate that into other areas and open up your audience. Then there's true marketing. Um, 
you know, the thing called Facebook, which I hated for a long time. You won't believe this, but I stayed away from Facebook as long as I could. Now I have two Facebook pages for myself and three for my business. But that gives us over an audience of almost 20,000 people that we reach now through Facebook, from 220 Publishing, 220 Communications, from my two pages, and then from our events page. Um, Meetup was a great spot for me because it was people that they're out there sitting up, raising their hands, saying, I like this, so come find me. So that's a great opportunity if you have a business, find an affinity on Meetup. We started Meetup groups for different cities because what did I need to do? I needed to expand all of the 220 properties into other cities. So it's positioning, branding, marketing. And then there's free marketing and there's paid marketing. So it goes into that as well. That was a long answer to your question. No, that was but those good. Are like, thank you. Thank those you. are like the three pillars of what I do. Thank you. And, and then the other is building expertise, but we'll talk about that later. So. Can I have one quick tip as well, too? Um, you mentioned about word of mouth, too. Um, mm -hmm. You definitely want to make sure that you have some idea of what your ideal customer is. The customer who gives word of mouth, who is the ideal customer, will, will attract somebody else who's also worthwhile to work with. Um, I mentioned a little bit about fraud before, and it, my, one of the mistakes I made early on was I was thinking, okay, everyone, not that everyone needed a website, but I thought that, that was like the key indicator. And it turned out that in some instances, some of the people were not as well as I thought they were. And I had to differentiate, figure out what that persona was, and figure out that it was changing to some degree. Um, Gain the right personas, um, and when you do have someone who, um, or customers that, have, that you have worked with, put them on your website, highlight them in a blog. Um, if you go to the Zamana site, you'll see pictures of some of the customers I've worked with over the years. People like that, they cherish that, they want to see that they are, and new customers want to see that they will be treated based on how you treat the old. Thank you. Also, I just want to add to what he said, knowing, um, well, pre being able to pre-qualify your client, knowing who your client is and who is not your client. That, I really had to learn that the hard way as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and I've seen the signs and then I still took it and happened twice and said, okay, now I know the red flags and I just, I gotta go with it, you know. So yeah, as your business matures, you'll everyone realize Everyone is not that, your client. Right, and there are people you can work with and there are people you can't. There are people that don't do anything for your brand and you need to stay away. I've turned down people who come to events and do things because it doesn't fit my brand. And you have to understand that. You have to start to know who you are as a business, as a company. I don't care if you have 45 different things to do like we do. We at least know who we are and we know who we want to align ourselves with. We have about 10 minutes left and I want to make sure that I, um, before I bring some closing questions, if, is there anyone else who would like to ask me? Okay, I can't balance a checkbook. How are you guys <laughs> able to balance? That was one of yeah. the closing that was, questions. That was one of the questions I wanted to ask him, but I wanted to be a chakra. <laughs> Can I take this on? Um, I, I'm going to give you a little quick story. I had um, one, of my, one of my earliest partners was a web designer. Her name is Carol Lawson. Um, introduced me to a uh, software called FreshBooks. Uh, designers are very, they're the best people to follow if you're trying to learn anything about um, uh, not so much with accounting, but how to deal with customers that get paid. They are very serious. Yeah. Very serious. There are blogs. Go Google um, anything about web design and find articles. You'll find a lot of articles about you know how do you get paid, how do you deal with bad customers because they're used to it. They're, they most of the freelance they're used to it. Um, the thing that she was trying to inform me was number one, make it easy for your customers to pay. I know that everyone's heard of PayPal and, and invoicing. Um, the reason why I, I picked up on FreshBooks, um, and eventually went to QuickBooks eventually, but the reason why those tools are helpful is because you can see not only which customers are paying over time, which ones are paying on time, which means those are the people that you would focus on for maybe more business. There's an old saying, 80% of your business comes from 20% of, of what you do, but the trick is trying to figure out which 80 and which 20 is matching up. Um, and you want something that gives you some sort of picture over time. Um, FreshBooks is really good. Um, there's another one called uh, Invoicer that's really pretty good as well too. Uh, those are great starting off. I would say watch your volume over time because some of the fees will add up a little bit. I actually switched over to another tool now called QuickBooks. It's a QuickBooks Online, which is a little less and if you have enough volume it, it makes a little bit more sense than the uh, FreshBooks. But what allows me to the reason I did the QuickBooks is that it's also linked into my check-in, so I'm able to see what's going on there and make some decisions. Um, you want to be able to see, you want something that gives you something graphically that tells you 
you know, by month, by week, what is going on. Those tools will are a, a big help. I pass. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody? Everyone doesn't have Yeah, I have a different business model, so mine is a little bit built on distribution. Mm -hmm. So I get the checks first. So that makes it bloody to balance the checkbook because I get paid first. I set up a model that I was the owner of the business. So, you know, books are paid. We buy, distributors buy our books, or bookstores buy our books from the distributor. The distributor pays us, we pay the author. So that, that particular business model is pretty cut and dry. I get a report. Pay all these quarterly, everybody's happy. Um, same thing with our music business, same thing, we have a distribution model, so we do that. We just got into, and that's 80% of my business, and the other part of it is uh, we do an event called Wine Crawl. So 80% of my business is publishing and Wine Crawl, that's where we make most of our money from. Wine Crawl is direct sales, so I know we buy a ticket, we get the money. We know what we pay to the vendors. Um, the other part of it, we're getting more into consulting now, more people are coming to me. I've done a couple of classes on social media, so I get paid directly for that, which has been great because it's corporations and they pay me. That's the beautiful part. They don't even question what you charge, so that's beautiful. <laughs> so I want to do a lot more of that. Um, also, we do marketing services now, so we'll go back to our office who can't manage their own um, time on social media, and we literally become them. So we do what we call our takeover service, where we take over their social media and start working on them. So that's something we started to do. So that's the other 20% of my business. But those are like direct sales businesses. So I'm able to balance that out. I still use a spreadsheet. I want to get QuickBooks, but I use the old fashioned spreadsheet, profit and loss statement. Because for me, I like having my hands in it. It's getting too big. Next year, ask me that question, it'll be totally different. I'll probably do QuickBooks or I'll hire somebody to actually do my accounting for me. Because now it's become really hard to do royalty reports for 30 different people every quarter. That's a whole, that's like a half day's work. So I'm like, okay, I don't really want to keep doing this. So, um, but that's what I do right now. I still do the old fashioned spreadsheet thing because for me it's easier enough to, to do that because of the way the business models are set up. Two part of, oh, you want to go ahead? Yeah, I want to ask. With, I have a, much like yours and yours, a couple of different business models. And the, the number one thing was when I start off in business, like I think everybody, if someone that was breathing had a pulse, I want them as a customer. But then after you, <laughs> after you, I still <laughs> want <laughs> but, but, but after you in business for a while, one of the hardest things to learn as a business person is that you are a business. You have to treat it like, like and I always use the Kohl's model. When you go to Kohl's, you go up to that uh, cashier in their life. Do you want to charge that to your Coast card? Do you want a Coast card? You say yes. They don't just hand you a Coast card and now start charging. They get basic information from you. As a business person, you're kind of scared to get that basic information. Your name, where are you at, where can I collect my money? Yeah, right. But, but then as, as you grow as a business and you develop that um, good quality uh, product that you're going to have, what you got to do is you got to start being get a little stiffer with your credit terms. Instead of extending your credit terms to everybody with a heartbeat, you gotta say, well, I can only extend you $300, like Kohl's. After that, if you want something more than that, you need to put it in the deposit and we can take from that deposit, like a, a lawyer or whatever retainer. A retainer. Yeah, That's so you best. have to develop that because you have a good, solid business product. How do I know you're here today? So yeah. you, you're gonna have a good, solid product People are going to want your product. You just have to position yourself in the saying, I am a business. You're going to pay me and make it easy. Yeah. Cash, check, credit cards, set it up, make it easy for them to pay you. Yeah, and get paid first. Get paid first. <laughs> That's the key. Figure Absolutely. out how to get paid first. Yeah. It's a, especially if it's a service based business. Then retainers, those are decent. Retain lawyers. You can never go to a lawyer and be like, hey, I need you to show up in court for me, yeah. and I'll get you on the back end. No, you're going to pay a retainer for the pay that they do. And you want to sign a contract. Mm -hmm. And have contracts, too. Yeah. Contracts. They have contracts. So they said, oh, she didn't say that. Last two questions. Yeah. Um, the first one is about money again. Um, there's an old saying, it takes money to make money. And one of the most difficult things um, as a growing entrepreneur and as you all are, how do you give yourself permission to 
put that five hundred dollars down to buy an office rent or to business cards, website? Like, how do you know how much? Too much? I don't make that much. I'm still taking care of my whole family, but I want to grow this dream. So, talk about that a little bit. Investing in yourself. I, I like to do that because that's it's. I've invested thousands of dollars in you know in myself and in my business since I started. And most people were like, why would you spend all that money? And I realized I had to take the, the picture. Most people spend hundreds of thousands of dollars or at least tens of thousands of dollars on their college education. Or, you know, if their kids, if they send their kids to private school or something like that. We spend money on structured education that's gonna give us a 30, 40, maybe a six figure income. But we won't do this, the exact same principle that could make us millions. So I, I had to come to grips with, well, have, have the potential to make us millions. I had to come to grips with, if I invest in me, then that investment is going to pay out more than I could ever imagine. That's a great way to That's good. That is really good. Yeah. I think that. That pretty much that summed, right. summed it up. Um, I'm going to ask you in the last minute that we have, um, quickly, if you can do it in one sentence to two, what was your biggest fear about going into business, but now what is your greatest um, reward about being in business for yourself? We'll start that way this time. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, my biggest fear always will always be failure. I am afraid to fail. That's why I work so hard at not failing. Um, my greatest accomplishment is to truly see people's lives change from what they read. Um, publishing has become something that I thought was not going to be a big part of what I did. I thought it was going to be a nice enhancement. Mm -hmm. And to see our books, that we put our name on, change lives. I look at your book and what it's done for people. I look at other books and really change lives, not only of the person that wrote it, but the people that read it. So you're affecting people that you may never meet. And I think that's an amazing power to be able to say you, you contributed to it. Awesome. Can you set a question again? Your biggest, what was your biggest fear about going into business for yourself? But what now is your great, it also is your greatest reward. So you're showing both sides of the coin. That this was the fear, I did it anyway, and now look what I did to you. I think my biggest fear with, um, I use um, photography, my biggest fear was um, being afraid that um, I would be put into this circle of, oh, everybody does that. You know, how many photographers do you have out here? Tons. So, but now my greatest reward, reward is being in that circle, but I'm in my own box. And now, I put a price on me and what I cost. You mentioned competition earlier. I wanted to comment on competition with me. I don't, you have to be careful. What about your competition? I'm like, no, what? There's a million photographers out here. I don't have time to think about that. No, this is what I cost if you want me. And that's it. It's like I had to grow into that. So that's, that's, that's great. My biggest fear was being successful. The fear of being successful because of being successful, I don't know what kind of person I was going to be uh, because if I was making $50,000 this year, my goal is to make $100,000. What is that Daniel going to look like? Because I have to be a different person to be Still at that level. That. Yes. Yeah. So that was my biggest fear. My biggest, uh, what was the reward. reward? Was being successful <laughs> <laughs> because I Good hit answer. that and I'm right where I wanted to be. Yeah. So each year is the same thing. You, you're fighting. I'm going to, I know I'm going to be at this level six months from now. What is that guy going to look like? That's awesome. Biggest fear was definitely failure, um, that I, I couldn't do it because that wasn't something that I saw growing up. Uh, but my biggest reward now is to, it, it's actually two. One, in the person that I became on this journey and the person that I continue to become on this journey, um, and then secondly, the 
information and the ability to affect change in my own children. That is the biggest reward that I can think of, that they don't have to go through a certain system and get conditioned and then have to get reconditioned to something else. I can stop that now and condition them for success. I have a couple of fears, but I'm going to try to focus on one. <laughs> um, the biggest one, one of the biggest ones I really have had is, um, I think, being a black professional and independent. And let me explain what I mean by that. It's, it's a lot of times you are not taken seriously in corporate America, um, sometimes because you're a woman, sometimes, you know, for being a minority. It's one thing when there's a steady paycheck, it's something a little different when you're on your own, because now it's more like, okay, yeah, I'm not being taken seriously, and now I won't eat, basically, because of it. Um, um, and that was a fear that I, I, I think that fear, I think I learned over time that that fear was the same for me when I was at Ford, when I was an engineer. Um, and, it's, and I think there was a lot of things I was able to carry over from my experiences at Ford that gave me discipline to, to build my business.